We want to help you be the very best missionary so that you can give your very best to the people you're serving. What makes this podcast unique is it's done by missionaries for missionaries. How can we take timeless principles and apply them to our lives as missionaries? That's really our heart behind this. Welcome to this episode of the Modern Day Missionaries Podcast, and get ready for an unforgettable interview today. We have with us Dr. Judith Mayotte. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Stephanie. I'm so excited to have Judy with us today. I'm a strong believer in not overhyping things or setting expectations too high. But honestly, there's no way I could overhype today's guest. It is simply not possible because Dr. Judy Mayotte is among the top 10 most fascinating people I've had the pleasure of meeting in my life. And let me just say, I've met a few. I've met a few. Um, and Judy, I, I just can't wait for you to get to know her today. You know, got to orchestrate our meeting uh, a few months ago in the most unexpected way. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But from overcoming polio as a child and learning to walk again, to becoming a nun, to becoming a widow, yes, you heard that right, and there is a story there, to earning a PhD, to winning an Emmy, to becoming a university professor, to living in multiple refugee camps and war zones, to authoring a book, to losing a leg, to working as an advisor to the Clinton administration, to serving on Desmond Tutu's Peace Council, and that's not even all of it. You have never met anybody like Judy. Uh, she has really honestly lived one of the most storied lives I think I've ever heard of. And so we're going to be talking to Judy today about how to find joy when life throws huge curveballs. As I'm sure you just heard when I did that little tiny snippet of her life, Judy's had curveballs coming at her all throughout her life, but she's a person of joy and purpose and grit. And Judy, on top of that, she's kind, she's humble, she's genuine. How do I know that? Well, let me just tell you the really beautifully surprising way that we met. We were trying to remember exactly when it was. I think this was back in September, October. Um, my husband, Danny, and I were down at a hotel near the Mayo Clinic, speaking at a church down there. And we went for dinner in kind of this communal eating area they had there. And as we were sitting down, we weren't really sitting by anybody. And Danny looked across and saw Judy, who we didn't know yet, just sitting over there at a table by herself. She had just sat down. And he, he said, oh, look at her. She looks fun. Should we go see if we can sit by her? He's a total extrovert. And I, I'm game for adventure. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I go, why don't you just first go make sure that she's okay with that? Because you never know. And so I remember Danny came over to you, Judy, and asked if we could sit with you. And you were so welcoming and warm. And then we had such a great conversation. And the longer we talked, the more fascinating it got. And uh, anyways, to make a long story short, we found out enough about your life that I knew we had to have you on today. And uh, I just want to thank you again for being with us, Judy. Well, thank you for asking me. And I will say I am going to be 87 in a few weeks. And um, so it's been a long, uh, long life, but it's been a great run. And I I just had um, a wonderful life all the way through. And um, I just enjoyed meeting you and Danny so very much. Uh, and other there at that uh, in Rochester, Minnesota. Yeah, it, we, we both knew right away that it, it had been orchestrated by the Lord. It was it was a really special meeting and for sure the highlight of our trip. And for all of you who, well, none of you, even if you're watching this on video, you wouldn't be able to see this. But Judy, when we met you, you were in a wheelchair. And so we knew that you had some type of physical disability and you shared that story with us and how it has not held you back at all. And I wondered if we could just start today by you sharing that particular life-changing event. It was indeed a life-changing event, uh, but it wasn't the first one that I had been through. So um, it wasn't something that, that held me back. Um, I was working on... Um, uh, I was working with refugees, and I had been working with refugees for a number of years, first writing a book, Disposable People, The Flight of Refugees, uh, Refugees International, 
and the Women's Refugee Commission, two uh, organizations that are advocacy organizations, and then uh, the International Rescue Committee, which is an on-the-ground uh, humanitarian organization, one of the best in the, in the world, I would say. And uh, this particular uh, trip was one to the war zone in southern Sudan. And it was before uh, South Sudan came into being. It still was when it was all one Sudan and, and there was the, the civil conflict between the North and the South. Um, and, um, and so I was, and sometimes I would go in there clandestinely if the, if the government of Sudan would push all the humanitarian workers out because part of the weapon of war was to withhold access to food and health care so that people would just die naturally and they wouldn't have to use their munitions to kill people. Um, but, um, and so uh, I might go in there, you know, blind and below the radar. Or um, on this time, it was uh, through the SPLA, which was the, um, the Southern Sudanese military force, uh, led us into their area of some the visionaries filming um, uh, of the story of what was going on in southern Sudan. And so we had gone up that morning uh, to the little village of Ayod, which was way up in southern Sudan, way north in southern Sudan. Um, and it was in what was known in a trip before that I had gone as the Starvation Triangle. And it was Bor, Kongor, and Aya, these three villages that were, that you just couldn't find life. E even, um, you know, villages without children under the age of five uh, for that. So it was, it was a devastating war uh, for the civilians um, in southern Sudan. And so we went into um, the village of Ayod and... Um, uh, we're filming there a food drop. And of course, um, I think most of your viewers know that, that food drops uh, are absolutely necessary if people in these remote areas are going to be fed during uh, times of conflict. And, um, and I'd been to many, many drops before. And drop sites are huge. They're, I'd say, three football fields long. Um, you know, and, and fairly wide. And um, the um, World Food Program people put down white plastic all over so that the, uh, the plane can see exactly where the drop site is. And the danger in a drop is if the plane drops too short or too long, you know, and hits a village or, or hits people out in the fields or whatever it is. But you're always exactly where the plane that pilots tell you to go. And so the pilots, you know, we were way off to the side of the, of the, of the drop site. And, um, and even as the planes were making their practice runs around through the help of the, of the um, World Food Program person on the ground, um, they asked us to be, move even further away, which we did because you always obey the pilots. <laughs> And uh, so we thought we were, as in all drop side, drops, we thought by, uh, by doing what they told us to do, we were out of the danger zone. And so then the World Food Program gave the okay to drop. And um, as the plane uh, was coming closer, we saw that it was way over toward us rather than coming along the drop side. It was much more coming, um, you know, toward us. And so the uh, World Food Program people tried to get them to um, uh, change their course, uh, you know, and get closer to the drop side. And then uh, we started running uh, because we saw that it was still coming. And the World Food Program people tried to get them to abort the drop. But what happens is that um, the, uh, there's, there's uh, two pallets. And one and uh, 15 tons on one pallet and 15 tons of bags on another pallet. And they push one out on the first round. And then the pallet opens up and all the bags start, you know, coming down all over the sky there. And um, so they did not abort. And, um, and the 
pallet was pushed out, the bags opened, it opened up. And so we were just running for our lives. And fortunately, um, I must have tripped uh, because the bag hit my leg instead of my head. So I'm here to tell it. Uh, but um, uh, it, it did hit, it, it made, I guess, a great big hole in the ground the way that it, it I mean, it was a, a hundred, over a hundred pound bag of grain coming at 120 miles an hour down. Oh, my God. But there was, I mean, there was no reason for that plane to be um, off course because it was a perfectly clear day. It had done two practice runs around the, the drop site, and then it just went the wrong way. And nobody to this day knows why not one bag went anywhere near the drop site. But anyway, it didn't. And fortunately, I was the only one that was hit. And so... These wonderful uh, soldiers that were in the middle of the war, you know, um, and there are two things happened, um, but um, these wonderful soldiers uh, got a an old army cot, and they took their um, Kalashnikovs or AK forty sevens or whatever it is off their shoulders and put them on the ground, you know, and then they uh, put me on that um, on that. Uh, caught that they brought out to the field. But first, uh, what happened, the reason I'm alive is because when we come out of the base camp of Lopachokio on the Kenyan side of the border, uh, we go and we sit on a, on the floor in a supply plane. And if there's room for us, we go. And if there's not, if you know, if there's too many supplies and there's not room for us, we don't go. And so that day at the last minute, uh, a UNICEF doctor, uh, came up um, and uh, wanted to get on to, you know, wanted to go to the village to the feeding center that day. And so um, she did. And um, and because, and so they, they went to the village to get her and she came out and my uh, artery was broken in the groin. And so I would bleed it. It's actually what happened. But we also, because it is a, an active war zone, uh, we fly in from Lokachopio each day and go back to the base camp at night. We don't stay up there all night. And so the plane the, uh, was still there for us that had brought us in. And um, so they carried me, you know, to the plane. And then they uh, got me down to Lokachopio, the base camp, and uh, called the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross Doctors, to come from their hospital over to Lokachopio and set up uh, a mini operating theater in the tool shed there at Lokachokio. And so they, they stopped the bleeding and then they brought another plane in from, uh, the, um, from another drop site that hadn't dropped yet. And so they carried me over the banks of grain, just like one that hit me, to, that knocked my, my leg to some other range, you know, to get me down to Nairobi and to save my life. And so here I am to tell the tale. Uh, many years later. And uh, so life has been rich and full uh, totally in those 30 years following. It was a missing leg and not a missing, let's say, let's say thanks be. You know, I remember when you told us that story um, that night at dinner, I remember what you said afterwards. You said the thing that you were most disappointed about and so I'm waiting to hear, what is she most disappointed about, about losing her leg? There are so many things. You said, is that I couldn't go into war zones anymore. And I sat back in my chair and I thought, did I hear this right? You've lost your leg. And the thing that you are saddest and most disappointed about was that you couldn't continue to go into war zones and do the type of work that you've been doing overseas. And that blew my mind. And I thought, well, that sums up Judy right there. Well, it was, I mean, it was such, so rich work to be able to be among people uh, who had lost everything, uh, who were uh, either uh, internal civilians within their own country or people who had fled across a border and had nothing with them. I mean, I look at the migrants today coming to our border and I think of how little they have and how much they want to build a life that is uh, rich and and um, uh, and useful, you know, that they want to work and they want to make a living and they want to have a home and they they 
I mean, it's just wonder. I mean, I met some of the most wonderful people and the most resilient people that I've ever known in my life uh, in those, in all of those refugee experiences, wherever I was, whether it was Bosnia or Pakistan, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Thailand, um, you know, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, uh, Sudan, uh, where it, Mozambique, wherever I was in war zones, it was, I mean, the people uh, and their goodness and their resilience and their, um, their generosity. I mean, they're sharing with people when they have nothing, you know, uh, it's, it, it just overwhelms you. And so it was, it was the richest work experience that I've ever had. Mm. Well, and what I love too, Judy, is that you continued to serve refugees your whole life. Like you still do to this day. You are still giving lectures on the impact of what's going on in the world and how it's affecting refugees. We were talking about you just finished a series of lectures. So you never let it stop you. It's You've just looked to see, okay, God, you used me in this season, in this way, now what's next? So what's a, a, a fun part of your story is after you came back, had surgery on your leg, got stable again, isn't that, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but isn't that when the doors open then for you to be a part of the Clinton administration? That's true. That is very true. That um, uh, the first Clinton administration um, started in 94, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, 94 to 97. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. And so I got a call um, and um, uh, inviting and you know inviting me to be a special advisor on refugee issues and policies, and I thought hmm, that would be nice. And so uh, and but you know government something that I had ever thought about going into or or doing. Uh, but this was this was an opportunity to uh, be able to. Um, I think one of the things that it really did was that it helped me really understand the parameters that government has as far as asylum and um, and and bringing people here or humanitarian care overseas. What you know, where well, the government the government involvement as far as humanitarian work is concerned, and so. Um, being there as a special advisor on refugee issues and policy in de the Department of State's uh, population, refugees and migration was an incredible education for me and um, and the ability to, you know, to do something at the same time for these people in a way that I could no longer do uh, being present hands on. Uh, in the refugee camps themselves, and so it was a, a very, very rewarding experience, and and I learned a lot, and it helped me. Then, um, as I went on, uh, taught in universities on refugee issues and policy and human rights and Sub-Saharan African history, and then I was able to set up two. Uh, service learning programs for two different universities, Seattle University and Marquette University. And um, so it, you know, it, it, things just fell in my lap, though. I mean, that's what I think is just wonderful is that the doors just opened and, uh, and I got invited in and um, was able to, um, you know, to do the work that I was doing, but in different ways. and. Today, what I mean, it just sort of overwhelms me when I really think about it. I mean, it is so rich and so exciting. But um, Refugees International, which was one of the advocacy organizations on whose board I serve, and now I'm an emeritus on all my boards. But um, anyway, um, at the time that our president, Ken Bacon, was um, uh, dying with a, um, a brain tumor, uh, he and his wife uh, were prescient enough to see that more and more people were going to be displaced because of extreme weather events and geophysical forces in our world, which is what we're seeing right now today. And so that really caught my attention. And um, and Ken, then uh, he and his wife set up a foundation that would set up a center for uh, climate displacement within Refugees International. 
which over the years since Ken has died, and I can't remember exactly what year he died, but it's been more than 10 years, you know, that, that, that all of this came about. I began looking at hey. issues dealing with climate displacement and, and climate change. And so now most of my work has to do with issues of climate displacement. And many of the migrants that we see coming to our own borders, particularly from Honduras and Guatemala and Nicaragua, are climate displacement people because of what's happened uh, with the hurricanes and the and the flooding and the droughts that are 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 in their uh, in their areas. So, um, you know, losing the leg was one thing, but it was a leg. It wasn't something that that um, that permanently put me out of the picture for some reason or another. And because I did have a PhD and could teach in university, then I was able to teach in universities and I was able to uh, continue on with, with, in the, you know, with refugee issues and policy, but also with the whole issues on climate. And so life just, I mean, it unfolds in different ways. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it. It's a very different way of doing it, and uh, and I don't go in war zones anymore. But my goodness, I, you know, what what richness has come to me simply because other doors opened just wide and let me in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think God opened those doors because He knew that you, Judy, was you were going to walk through them. You were going to mm -hmm. walk through them. Well, and it's just interesting. Uh, listening to your story, it's reflect. It's making me reflect on the experiences of a lot of our listeners who are either missionaries or who serve missionaries. And I think a big thing that's happened to a lot of global workers in the last couple of years is they've had to move back to their passport country. Like in your situation, they had to leave and they still wanted to be there or they're having to leave. And it can feel so frustrating when you first come back wondering, God, why would you take me out? I'm one of the few people who who are willing to move overseas or who's willing to do this kind of difficult work. But just because a door closes, it doesn't mean it necessarily even closes to missions or to serving others. I think that theme that's God's placed in our heart, for which for you was, was refugees. I mean, that was just a burning theme inside of you. God had other plans and he led you to ways uh, in which you could still continue to serve them. And, and he, it wasn't just like these doors magically opened. I mean, Judy, you also started programs. You were active. You were looking for opportunities too. But I think it's very encouraging again for all those people listening, remembering, hey, just because something has changed or you've had to move or things look differently does not mean there couldn't be even greater things ahead from you for you than the things that were behind. So Judy, what would you say are some strategies or practices that have helped you stay positive, stay focused on what God's given you to do? Uh, even as you've been facing loss, uh, emotional, physical challenges? Well, I think that staying in touch with God is pretty important, <laughs> you know. So I'm with you. <laughs> prayer is, is, is pretty important. And I think, Stephanie, I, there, there's, um, I think all of us have little uh, mantras or, or things that we, that we kind of stick with. And, um, and I have a few. Uh, and maybe I'll share those uh, those with you. And I think one of them is definitely be still and know that I am God. In other words, uh, if you're an exquisite listener to cultures, try to be an exquisite listener to the Holy Spirit and to and to God. And, and so prayer is is something that is is um, really really important. Um, I've also been influenced by the um, Ignatian spirit. Uh, of finding God in all things. And so whether it is my work with refugees or my work with climate or my work with, with um, homeless people here in Seattle or, or whatever it might be or, or just being with friends, you know, mm -hmm. it is finding God in all things. And, and, and the God that you find, I think, uh, for me at least, is the God of the Genesis creation stories of God saw that it was all very good. And so this whole of our creation, each person, um, each creature, each flower, um, each ant, each um, crocodile, uh, whatever, 
um, it's, I mean, this, this joyous, wonderful, beautiful, magnificent creation that God created. So finding God in all things is another one. But by the same token, it, uh, I think of Karl Barth and Karl Barth, a German theologian, um, of great renown, uh, one saying that I have always is he always said, uh, you know, carry the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And so um, we are of God's good creation. We are of this world. And, and everyone is, um, a, is every, everything is created by God and everything is good. Um, and so um, I, I, I really see that. And I happen to have been born into the Christian tradition and have, tra have stayed with the Christian tradition itself. But, you know, I see a Jesus who walked the dusty roads of Galilee and helped us understand how to live with one another. And, of course, that all comes out of the great commandment of love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. And the Good Samaritan story is the story of that, that neighbor, um, that beautiful neighbor love uh, that we all can engage in. And I just try to live with people, and I hope that in some way um, I can carry the imago dei, the, ima the image of God, just through my life. Um, and, um, and I don't... Um, I, I'm just not a preacher or a uh, or a proselyte, you know, proselytize or, or or that's just not me. And so, well, and God's made us all so different. I mean, yeah. obviously, there's the aspect of all sharing our faith, but I do think we all do it in different ways. There are right. some where God has just given them a gift to to share and to speak, and there are others like you mentioned who live it so yeah. vividly that people are attracted and they come up to you and they ask. Why are you different? How are you different? And I think we're all called to a combination of that. And yet God has created us differently for a reason, because each one of those people are going to connect with someone different. So you are a doer, Judy. You That's, are a doer. But that, because I'm very shy about, about, uh, about it, my, spiritual, my spirituality. And, and I admire people who can, you know, and, and who do. Um, and so I, it, you know, mine been to um but i do i do know how valuable prayer and being with our creator god and it's is so is it's just vital i mean for any of us um who are who are in this work and i don't think you know i'm i'm i wonder i wonder what it's like without faith to be in for me, at least, in conflict situation, you know, I mean, when I've seen, I mean, I've seen people freshly blown up by landmines and I've, you know, I've seen mass graves. I've seen, uh, I've, I've run from, I've run from shelling. And I know that that for me is, is once in a while, whereas for others, I mean, it's every day, it's every minute, you know, that they never know when the, when the bombs are next. Uh, and so I, I think that, that somehow we have to know that there is a transcendent um, being that, that cares deeply for us and, um, and wants us to be, you know, the best that we can. And how, how we share it, as you say so beautifully, Stephanie, is, is different, um, you know, um, in, in each person. And sometimes I wish I could share it more. You know, that I didn't have. That. Oh, but I love the way that you do it. I mean, I, I that's why I think I, we love having different types of guests come on. And we've got, you know, some missionaries, a part of modern day who they do evangelical crusades and they're sharing their faith boldly with large groups of people. And then we've got some who are in closed countries where they have very few opportunities. They're not there as visible missionaries. They're there serving for a different purpose. And through their lives, they look for those little opportunities. So. I appreciate you sharing your story. I think it's it connects with people who might be serving in those types of fields. I even look at your life too, and I think, okay, you served part of your life overseas. But when you began your ministry back with Mary Noel, you were serving in urban missions right in the U.S. And we have a, a lot of people who are serving directly in the U.S. or in their passport country doing missional activities right there. And that is hugely valid as well. So there are 
people in need of Jesus. There are refugees. I mean, we talked just about even about refugees. There are refugees overseas, and they're increasingly more and more in the United States all the time. You know, Judy, I read this quote in your Disposable People book, which I've got. I went and picked it up, found it on a used book. My favorite used bookstore is called Abe Books. And so I'm always hunting down books on there. And I found yours. And there's this quote. Let me find it that you said in there that just it was just so you when I read it. It said (laughs) being like it was a good summary quote. I loved it. It said being a wanderer of sorts myself. I understand how refugees determine against all odds to grow where they are planted, to forever continue to compose their lives with laughter and with joy, even in the midst of pain, insecurity, and loss. And so for you, you were serving people going through extreme circumstances. And so I wonder how that impacted your ability to uh, to grow and flourish through some of your difficult circumstances. It was the people I was with, Stephanie. I mean, it was it was it was just being with them. I can't explain that exactly, but but you're in the midst of people. You're in the midst of people, I think, who if I'm if I'm thinking of your your question correctly, um I you know, being in the midst of people who are serving, but also people who are being served. And um and those being served are serving those of us that are serving. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it it, yes. it is all of us. Um, it is all of us together, and um, and I think that, um, that that is what uh, really um, has kept me going. And I and I and and I have found ways. I mean, I I know that those. I felt the frustration of not being over there. I, I can remember the first, you know, right when I first lost my leg, I thought, oh, I'll just get a prosthesis and I'll just go back over and just do it. You know, I mean, I think that's no big deal. And so um, even though it was a big deal, I, you know, I, I thought, man, I'll just get, you know, you wear a prosthesis and you go. But because of my polio, fortunately, it did hit my bad polio leg and, and, the one that got knocked to smithereens rather than my good leg, but the I can't wear a prosthetic device, and so um, as a result, it hampered me more than what I thought it was going to hamper me, and so there were months of frustration. I I understand that those of you who are coming back from overseas or being knocked out of of whatever you know whatever way that you were serving. Um, in one way or another, uh, that um, that you do have that frustration. But if if your frustration doesn't close your doors, you know, if you are if your frustration is one of searching, I guess maybe I I haven't thought of that before. But but maybe uh, whether you're whether you're conscious of the searching or not. There are doors that open, and there are other ways to do things. Um, and so I found that, um, you know, I never, even even the way that I went into working with refugees was not the way that I had planned. I had planned to go with Mary Noel to Somalia to work with refugees and to be over there for a period of years and not just you know, going back and forth. I had never in my life thought of writing a book or being an advocate or doing public speaking or, you know, I never, never was going to, I mean, that just was not on my at all. And that is, I guess, where God left, led me, you know, I mean, where, where it ended up leading me because I did go into television also. And I learned how to tell stories. And so I thought with the book that, uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, that, 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 that with a book, I could, I could tell the story better. I mean, it would, it would be longer last book than a television program would be refugee. So I decided, I think I'll just write a book. I, I had a perfectly wonderful job at Turner Broadcast. I, I mean, I, I could have stayed in, in television and, and, and Judy thought. won an Emmy. You were doing pretty good over there. I did. Yeah. But anyway, 
Um, so I, so I, I thought, you know, and, and, and I, and when I went into television, I didn't know diddly about television either. And I think, you know, I've, I've always, I, I grew up in a time when you could do things by the seat of your pants though. I mean, you know, you didn't have to have a lot of training and a lot of this and that that you have to have now, you know, I mean, I think it's harder for young people now to go into, into different skills. But anyway, um, I, I just decided to work with, to write a book on refugees. And so I just, but because of my academic background, I also had the ability to do research. And so I knew how to go to people and find out how do I do this and how, how do I get in touch with this person and how do I get into these refugee camps and how do I, um, you know, do that. And so I think that, um, that the thing in frustration and coming back and when we have radical change in our life is just keep yourself open to what the possibilities are with the skills you already had um, in one way or another. Uh, because I had, I had those skills, didn't know diddly about, about refugees, didn't know diddly about television, but I had ways of knowing how to ask questions and to learn and to see that, yeah, I could do that, and that would make a difference as far as refugees were concerned, or that would make a difference as far as understanding the United States was concerned when I was with television. You know, so I think that it, it's always your frustration is there, but make it a frustration that has an open mind and that you still see, whoo, there's other things to do out here. And, uh, and it's really exciting. And I mean, I cannot tell you how exciting my life has been post accident and up until today. And even now, I mean, you know, doing series of talks on, on climate displacement and on climate issues and trying to get us to, to love this good creation that God has given us. That's fantastic. And I actually really appreciate that you took some time to talk about the frustrations because that was a next question I was thinking of. You know, people can look at you now and be like, oh, look at her amazing life. And she's so happy and positive. And but didn't she ever have seasons that were hard or frustrating? And so you acknowledge that. And so I would even say digging in that into that even a little bit more. Judy, were there any moments in life with all the things that hit the loss of your leg, the loss of your husband? I mean, just to name two of all the things that you went, where you felt like giving in the towel, or throwing in the towel, or you felt like giving up or you felt overwhelmed by grief. Um, I'm not so sure that I ever felt completely overwhelmed by grief um, as such. But let me just give you one example. I think that, that, that always in my life, at least, you know, that I was fortunate enough that, that somehow incidents or people came forward. And I can well remember when I was thinking, what, that, with the leg again, um, uh, the, the grief... I had a perfect marriage for a very short time. I had wonderful years as being a nun, but it just was not right anymore. So there wasn't, I mean, there was a lot, there was a huge sense of loss in leaving the convent, um, in that, but it wasn't something that, 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 over, you know, I, 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 I was able to go, always able to go forward, but I was always given opportunities to go forward. Even when Jack died, um, you know, even with polio, learning to walk again, uh, it just took time. And then I then I went on. So I have been fortunate in that. But I remember well how um, uh, Madeline Albright actually was uh, someone who turned a corner, made help me turn a corner. And it was on a t it was when I was recovering with uh and learning to walk without my leg. And uh, at that point, I didn't know that I wasn't going to have a prosthetic device yet, but, but at, the, at the time, and it was the middle of the night, and I turned on C-SPAN in my room, and there was Madeline Albright. And to this day, I don't remember exactly what she said, but there was something that she said on that C-SPAN thing that made me all of a sudden say, yes, I can go ahead. And um, whether it was about her childhood, you know, she had been a refugee herself and, and 
And that I, I really don't remember. I was given the opportunity to thank her in person for that. And that always grateful when you can thank somebody in person, you know, that has made a big turn in your life. But look, you know, I think, I think look for, look for those moments that come. And, and, um, and that was a moment of inspiration. And so I think that, that when you're in a frustrating space, if something nudges you, accept that nudge or, or, or be open to that. I think, again, it's just being open to the future because there is going to be a future uh, without a husband or no longer a nun or without a leg or, or something. But, but there is a future. And that future can be good if we let it be good. And if we listen, you know, again, listen exquisitely to the Holy Spirit, to God coming through people to us in one way or another. I mean, Madeline Albright came to me on a C-SPAN in the middle of the night uh, somewhere along the line. But it was enough inspiration that it really, um, it really helped me left and say, I can go forward. When I, when I kept thinking, what, how in the world without this leg, am I going to do what I want to do? And God does speak to us in such unique ways sometimes. But like you said, it's, it's keeping your eyes and ears open because it can be, I mean, in the most unexpected places through the most unexpected people, sometimes not even people, sometimes it's an object or something in nature and you just hear a message loud and clear. Yeah. It's a, it's a flower. It's a, it's a sunset. It's a, I mean, it can be anything from God. That's what I think is so neat. It's, but it, it, it really is. Uh, and I'm not a Pollyanna ish, uh, just, um, never down person or anything like that. I mean, I have my ups and, and as we all do, you know, and I, I have to figure out things, but my goodness, what a, journey I've been given. I mean, the gift of the life that I had is so privileged. Thank you for helping us always just, or thank you for helping us in this conversation, keep our perspective right, keep our eyes on the future, on opportunities, because it can be, uh, it can almost feel when you're in the midst of a tragedy, like there's blinders on, like you just can't imagine what the future could hold. You can't see anything other than what is right in front of you. Uh, but you're right, Judy. I know everybody listening, I'm sure, has been through at least one, if not many crises in life. I can think of so many of my own where you do. You just I think that's the enemy's tactic. He'd love to tell you that there's nothing left for you. How could it ever be better than what it was? But there is. There's always something ahead. And it's not a cliche thing. It's called the Christian life. It's called having faith in a God who is so much bigger and greater than we ever could be. And I think, too, that um, remind yourself always, I am mission wherever I am. I mean, in God in all things, because if you're a missionary, that's a calling. And I think that, that wherever, you know, even if you get pulled back somewhere or you don't get to do exactly what you think is what the mission is for you, remember you're in mission for God. I mean, you are absolutely right. I mean, it's, it, it, it's not us. It's, it's, you know, it's not our, it's not my mission. It's God's mission. You, you think, Isn't that right? You can, we can forget so easily. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are, conversation, and we remember it. <laughs> that's right. It's not all about me and my calling and my purpose. I mean, that's important, but it's our calling and purpose is always about others. No, I, I'm even just thinking personally and thinking as as you're talking, Judy, my own life, like where I'm at now with being with modern day missions and getting to um, create resources and find resources for missionaries. And this isn't what I would have ever imagined my life being. And it's not the end. I mean, I'm I'm 43. This is going to iterate, I'm sure, many more times in life. But I had a vision for my life was I thought we were just going to stay in Peru forever. And I was not real happy about it when we came back. Uh, and yet, missions is a passion of mine. So he's opened up a way for me to be able to still do missions from where we're at. And through our nonprofit that we have, 
serving missionaries and Spanish speaking pastors. And God can still use you to do things in just totally unexpected different ways. So, but it, it, it takes pushing through those really hard seasons of waiting and wondering. And sometimes those are really short and sometimes those are really long, uh, but there is an end to them and there is a new, uh, a new season that God has for us. So thanks for reminding us of that. Um, Judy, I, I could talk to you for like hours more. I'm sure everybody who's listening probably wants to know so many more things. I, we are leaving people with questions. I'm so sorry if you're listening and you have more. You can find like, uh, if you go on Wikipedia, you can find Judy and get a little bio of her life, which is so fun. If you want to delve into her work from 1992, Disposable People, this is fascinating. It's a history lesson and, a, and it's full of stories. And Judy, you're a brilliant writer. And then, Judy, tell me again, what was the name of the, the television show and the episode where people can actually go and watch what happened when you lost your leg? Okay, it's, it's called uh, Visionaries. And I think that uh, if you go and if you just Google um, Judy Mayotte Visionaries, I think that will get to get it to the episode now because Visionaries now has closed down. I mean, you know, the series has closed down. It went for 20 some years, 25 years or something. And um, and this was the very first program that they did for the whole series. Oh, my um, gosh. Sam Waterston, who was the law and order person, has done this, has been the narrator of this whole series from the very beginning. And Sam and I served on Refugees International together, uh, a board, you know, served on that board together. And so he's he's graciously done all of those, that whole series. I know it's on YouTube. And so the very, very first one, and it was filmed in 1993, I guess. When I was a bit younger than 80s, I am now. <laughs> but you're still 87 and going strong. And we are so grateful that you came on to share some of your story with us today to inspire us and just to even breathe some fresh hope and some fresh life into people who needed some today. So thank you, Judy. Well, thank you. And good luck to you. With this wonderful um, series that you're doing. Well, thank you. and. Everybody else who joined us today, thanks for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode.